turn please to the book of Romans. We will this morning, with God's blessing, finish chapter 15 of that book, beginning with verse 30 and going to the end of the chapter, verse 33, those four verses for our message this morning, a message about the place of prayer. Paul will solicit the prayers of the Romans, he will tell them the goal of the prayer, and he will end in a doxology of prayer. When we read these four verses, and then with God's help, we will dig into them, unpack them. Romans 15, verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So we are going to find here, as we look at these final verses of this chapter, as we're coming close to the end of this book of Romans, which we've been in for quite some time here, the place of prayer, the primacy of prayer, the power of prayer, the need for God's people to pray and to pray constantly and pray with this agonizing intensity as we will see. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is asking for exactly that. People he has not had a chance to visit, he seems, as we will find out in the next chapter and we'll discuss in more detail, to have known many of them personally. And yet at a church that has never had him visit. He writes this confidently, knowing that they will pray. And this apostle, this church-founding missionary apostle, who gave his all for Christ in so many ways, needs this. He needed, he needed to know that God's people were indeed praying for him. He sought the prayers of all the churches. It was to him a crucial leg of his work, without which he was cast adrift, not adrift from Christ, but from the network of support intended by our Lord as the means by which and through which he would accomplish his purposes. And he does that by and through those who are prayed for. These last four verses, if these last four verses in this chapter mean anything, it is the necessity, the primacy, and the power of prayer. His request that Rome join him in prayer is not an afterthought. It's not like, okay, well, I've given you these 11 chapters of doctrine and theology. I've given you a few chapters of application. What did I forget? Oh, yeah, we're supposed to pray. No. Prayer is at the end of the letter, and that exaggerates its importance that amplifies how crucial this was to him as it should be to us. Not an afterthought. He's beseeching them. Some versions of our Bibles actually tr translated, I beg you to be in prayer with me. I beg you. I beseech you. I exhort you. I need this. Not a perfunctory sal salute to some rote procedure. Part and parcel of the Apostle Paul's entire framework of what ministry is and how Christ, through men with feet of clay like himself and like all of us, how he accomplishes what he will. But that Christ should choose to work through men, none of us could do anything. And this Christ, who is our Lord, he has ordained prayer as the means by which we lift to him what he already knows, and the way we ask him to do that, which he has already decided, all through prayer. You know, Paul calls them brothers. I beseech you, I beg you, my brothers. The appeal is made to fellow believers. It's made to those who are bound with him by a common faith. Today we hear so often in times of tragedy, people say things like, our thoughts are, and prayers are with you or with them. And while we can thank people for their well wishes, and if I were the victim of something that elicited those well wishes, I'd be grateful enough for it, as would you be. But well wishes and thoughts and prayers, they amount to nothing more than good manners and convention. 
It becomes something that is said. And most especially when we compare it to what a prayer is and what a prayer actually accomplishes and who hears our prayer. Do you wish me well wishes? Do you say my thoughts and prayers are with you when something goes wrong? Thank you. It's almost like, I'm glad you're not against me. But when a brother or sister says, I am praying to God in Jesus' name for you, well, there's something bigger than a well wish or a thought. When a brother or sister prays, when God the Father has before him a prayer that comes to him by the intercession of his Holy Spirit, when a prayer is groaned out by us and then transformed to the will of God by that Spirit of God, when the blood of Christ Jesus has by faith bathed the one who comes to the throne of grace, the God of the universe hears such prayers as those. Let us say thank you to our friends for their positive thoughts and what they call prayers, but let us go to those whose prayers go as memorials to God's very altar to receive prayers that are prayers indeed. The next phrase sets Christ and his Holy Spirit together as the basis of these prayers. The Apostle Paul said, Pray for me by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. They're not being coerced here as though he were saying something like, by the authority granted me by Christ, I command you to pray. Rather, it is as much for him as for them to remember that Christ Jesus is the reason that prayers are heard in any case. It's the Spirit of God who is the conduit by whom our prayers are brought before God. And so by the Lord Jesus Christ, And the love of the Spirit. On that basis, he asks for, he beseeches, he appeals, he begs for these prayers. Now we need them both. Jesus knows all things and he sits now at the Father's right hand and he rules all things and working especially through his lordship over his people, which is the church. So we need both these things that he says about Jesus Christ our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of the Spirit. He especially works through His Lordship. He's Lord and Master, but remember, He is in heaven and He's in bodily form. He is there in the form which we will one day enjoy, which you will one day enjoy, you will one day have, if your faith is in Jesus Christ. As 1 Corinthians 15 makes so clear, we will follow in a resurrection like His. We will be like Him. But he's there now in that form, in a bodily, in a real and literal body. So Jesus must work through his spirit and spirit working through his people. We need both of these. Jesus our Lord and the Holy Spirit for everything. And we need both of these attributions that Paul gives them here. Our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Spirit. Why do we need them both? Because lordship implies authority. He is Lord and he is to be obeyed. And then the other thing that Paul says about the Spirit, the love of the Spirit. The Spirit is the person of God who who poured God's love into our hearts. That's Romans chapter 5 verse 5. See, we need both. We need to have the love of the Spirit and we need lordship and never one without the other. Love without Lord is just emotionalism without discipline. Lordship without love becomes slavish submission, neither of which is appropriate. One without the other isn't Christian. Both together bring balance and bring this proper proper basis for prayer. Just what the, the apostle says here. By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. Because we love God, we go to Him. Because He answers our prayers. Because He hears our prayers. Because He knows what we need before we ask. Because He loves us. That love of God poured into our hearts. By the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He commands us to pray. Why? So He can watch us bow down before Him just because He told us to? Well, we should. 
but because it's good for us. Christ gives commands that are for our good, for the good of our souls, the good of our spirit, to grow more and more into his image, to gain confidence in God as we go to him for things that are impossible for any but him to do. And then when he does them, as we are commanded to go to him and ask him to do, is not our heart expanded towards him? Is not our confidence in his word and the promises of God in his word and the power of God in our lives increased? It's both. The love of the Spirit and the Lordship of Christ. We must have those together. Paul often sought the prayers of others to be with him. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us. 1 Thessalonians 5.25, brothers, pray for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, you also must help us by prayer. More than pray, Paul here in Romans is saying, strive with me. Strive with me. He, he, he will pray for himself, and he's going to pray for himself confident that he's joined with those who read this letter first. That word strive, it comes from a word that means to agonize together. To suffer together really is what it means. Prayer can be an agony. And we do well not to expect our sessions with God to always be easy. We are together with those for whom we pray. Together with those for whom we, and with whom we're agonizing. We, we say it so often, I wonder if we forget the depth of meaning behind it when we say something like, let us pray. Let us pray. Why does the pastor stand up and say, let us pray? Let's put the emphasis where it should be. Let us pray. Let us as a body together go before the God of the universe. Let us pray. Not the ordained man alone as though he were paid for this and so we ought to, he ought to provide this service. Not me speaking at you as though my thoughts and prayers were somehow more acceptable to God than yours. We agonize before God together as one body in Christ. Now one speaks at a time and usually that's me in this service but only for the sake of clarity and order. Dear ones, when you close your eyes and you bow with me, if I thought you were just following some tradition and not actually praying, I'd be lost. The Apostle Paul, if he thought that this were just some rote exercise that he sent them to do, and they said, oh yeah, Paul, we'll, we'll pray for you uh, as soon as I'm done with breakfast. Well, on my break at work, I'll remember to send up a, what do we call it, an arrow prayer? Not that there's anything wrong with those. But Paul's not asking for something in your spare time. Something when it's convenient. He's saying, with me together, bound with me by the Spirit, by one faith, one baptism, one Lord Jesus Christ, with me together, agonize over this. And we agonize together. We strive together. We need to be together in this holy endeavor. I'll read to you something Calvin says here. By bidding them to assist in this contest, he shows how the godly ought to pray for their brethren, that they are to assume their person as though they were placed in the same difficulties. And he also intimates the effect which they have for he who commends his brother to the Lord by taking to himself a part of his distress do so far relieve him. And indeed, if our strength is derived from prayer to God, we can in no better way confirm our brethren than by praying to God for them. I think Calvin gets the sense of this correctly. This idea that when we pray, when we agonize together, when we weep together, rejoice together, back in Romans 12, what are we doing? I think the modern way to say it is we're entering into their experience. We're one with them. By Christ, this is what the Bible says, that we together are a body, so we are one together. And we listen, and we talk, 
and we understand what the angst is that brought the prayer and why this person needs a hand on the shoulder to say, yes, brother, yes, sister, I am with you. And what elicits the, the tears from back in Romans 12, the weeping, or the expression of rejoicing together. Because that phone call you got from that doctor and heard that diagnosis for yourself or for your loved one, it's as if it came upon me. Read 1 Corinthians 12 and see how intimately locked together the Lord says we are. That's what Paul's saying here. And he's fully confident that that church, that Roman church, some 2,000 years ago, was praying for him like that. Not just let us pray for Paul as he goes to Jerusalem and faces the dangers there. Let us agonize for Paul as though, as it is really in fact, we are going there with him and facing what he is facing. And however it comes out, we will with him give all the glory to God. Paul has two specific things on his heart here. For this prayer. The first is that he may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. And second, that his service for Jerusalem, the saints in Jerusalem, remember the poor saints, we talked about them a few weeks ago, that the gift that he brings to them would be acceptable. Now he wrote this letter while he was in Corinth. When he left for Rome, he did it by way of Jerusalem, as we said last week, some 2,000 miles out of his way. Now, if you go through his journey and follow it in the book of Acts, you'll find that he stopped, when he left Corinth, he stopped in Ephesus to say farewell to the elders of the church there. And here's something he told them in his farewell address. It says, And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Think of how much his resolve was tested. When upon hearing this, those Ephesian elders begged him not to go. They begged him not to go. After Ephesus, they stopped in Tyre and they found disciples and they stayed for seven days and through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. The Ephesian elders had begged him. They pleaded with him. They wept over him. Don't go. He goes. Stops in Tyre. And they tell him, Paul, don't go there. Don't go there. After that, there was a man named Agabus where they stopped. They stopped in his house. A man named Agabus, the man who had uh, daughters who were prophetesses. He was known as a prophet. And remember what he told Paul? Remember this incident there? He took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. The author there, Luke, in the book of Acts goes on. He says, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I, have, for I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Did you notice that he asked for prayer for deliverance from the unbelievers? From the unbelievers. Even knowing by direct communication from the Spirit to himself and then by the Spirit to others, acknowledged to be speaking for the Spirit, that it was Christ's stated intention that he would not be. He says to the Romans, pray that I be delivered from them all the while being told in a direct communication, Paul, you will not be. The Lord told him you will be delivered to them. And every place he stopped along the way, all those ones I cited say, Paul, don't go. The Holy Spirit is telling us you will be delivered to them. In a very real way, he is asking the church to agonize, to agonize with him in a prayer that is in direct contradiction to God's clearly stated will. 
Do we find this odd? Does it lessen his stature in our eyes a little bit? Like, wait a second. Pastor, did you just point out to us that Paul's praying against God? That God's saying you're going to be delivered too? He says, okay, if that's what God says, I better ask Rome to pray against that and ask that I be delivered from. The exact opposite. Does it shrink Paul a little bit for us? It shouldn't. A loved one dying of cancer might have no possible medical hope. Every sign points to God's will that their time here is soon to end. We pray to a God of all power and mercy who often overrules the natural law. What do we call that? Mercy of God? The goodness of God? The kindness of God through His Son Jesus Christ upon His people? Yes. We call that a miracle. We call that a miracle. When God overrules the natural laws that He Himself instated, and sometimes for His name's sake, for the glory of His Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of His Holy Spirit, sets them aside and grants such healing. And we pray, we agonize. Have we not in this place done just that for others? Within our group, not far outside this small circle? And has not our Father answered? As we've agonized, said, Father, your will seems to be that this one is going to die. And yet we pray against that. And how many times has our Father answered in ways that can only be attributed to Him and all those other things I mentioned a moment ago, His mercy, His goodness, His kindness, and all that by and through His Son, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 12, if you look at that, you'll find Peter on Herod's death row. God's will is apparently he's going to be executed then. He's going to die for his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so to Christ's glory, it appears he's going to die soon. James had just been executed. When Herod found out that that pleased the Jews, he arrested Peter, and Peter's in jail. Death row, and it's coming soon. What did the church pray? God, deliver him. They agonized for Peter. And God sent an angel who delivered him back to the church. Paul had far stronger evidence of God's will than any eye could ever convey. He had confirmation by actual words of the Holy Spirit that in store for him was not not deliverance from the unbelievers, but to them. And we know from the book of Acts, that's exactly what happened. Well, there's another one who knowing God's will, actually did pray otherwise. And I mean none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. At Gethsemane, he prayed for the cup which had been put in his hand and put there before the foundation of the world. He prayed for that to be taken away. Even knowing that it was his Father's will, and how many times in John's Gospel did he say, I came to do my Father's will. My food is to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he's the eternal Son of God. He is God the Son. That cup was placed before him in eternity past. It never was not God's will that the Son should drink that cup, the cup of his wrath. And yet in Gethsemane, Jesus says, take this cup away. And he prayed that so hard, he prayed that so intensively, his agonizing was so great that he sweated blood, according to Luke's Gospel. The cup was not taken away. Yet Jesus, in the fullness of his humanity, prayed as though it could have been. You know, we don't know the will of God beyond the specifics of Scripture. Where the Bible is clear, we must not pray against it, but for strength to live in it. Where God says, for example, do not be unequally yoked, we cannot pray to him to bless an unequally yoked union. Where God says, he who will not work, neither shall he eat, we dare not pray something like, Lord, fill my table while my perfectly working right hand remains idle. We can't do that. Paul's hope is not just to be free from harassment or imprisonment. As he said, he was ready to die in Jerusalem, asking only that if he did, it be for the sake of Christ and his gospel. 
He repeats his desire to be able to come to Rome. That's what he wanted to do, to get there, to that fellowship, so that by God's mercy, he wrote, I may, by God's will, excuse me, by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. You know, we don't really know if this ever happened. He did get to Rome. I commonly read the end of the book of Acts, and there he is in Rome in chains, delivered into the hands of unbelievers, the Romans. And it's interesting that he asked to be safe from unbelievers generally, and he didn't specify the Jews. Had he been given to them, he surely would have died right then, immediately. As it was, he was given into the custody of the unbelieving Romans. His life was saved, and he was soon on his way to Rome as a prisoner. And once there, he had freedom to move about the city so that he might well have gotten to that church, but we can't be certain that he ever really did. But there are a couple of very important words here, or a few very important words that condition all this. By God's will. If by God's will, I might come and see you. If we understand that God is sovereign and that God is good, then when our prayers are answered differently than we had hoped for or prayed, we learn from that to pray all the harder. Not to give up, to pray more. To exert ourselves even more to the discipline of prayer. To agonize until our prayers are soaked in blood as they rise up to the God the Father. There are a few settled conclusions that will inspire more fervency in prayer than knowing that God's will is the final, final arbiter of all things and that His will is always and only good. So Paul says, by God's will, that's the equivalent of, as we say so often, if He wills or God willing. Even when we pray for that which it seems, and seems being the operative word here, seems when it seems that his will is other than our desire. We can save ourselves a lot of angst by saying, by God's will. And by that not saying, well, if it's God's will, then I won't pray. I've agonized enough. No, that's not the lesson here. By God's will, meaning we pray all the more we agonize until, as it were, we bleed as Jesus did, which of course we cannot and we will not, but I'm talking about that intensity of going before the Lord. By God's will. Knowing that we pray to a God whose will has been set forever in the heavens. Knowing that we pray to a God who hears us and answers us. Knowing that as we pray in His will, that his will is only and always for our good, and that good often being simply the glorification of his name. The last part of Paul's request to the church there is really a spontaneous blessing, an ejaculatory prayer, we might say. As he's asking them for prayer, he's considering where he's going, and he's giving them this request, this, this begging them, this appeal to pray. The confidence he has that they will indeed do it. He just burst forth, burst forth with this, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. This is the third time in this one chapter where he has made some special attribution of God. In verse 5, he calls him the God of encouragement and endurance. In verse 13, he is the God of hope. And here in verse 33 of chapter 15, the God of peace. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. The God we pray to is the God of all of these things. Encourage me. He calls him the God in verse 5, the God of endurance and encouragement. Encouragement is from a word that's often translated as comfort. In the original language, it was the same word. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes that God is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. And we do no damage to that, even in its meaning, if we change that to encouragement. He's the God of all encouragement, who encourages us in our tribulation. We could even put in endurance. The God of all endurance, who in gives us endurance in our tribulation. He's all of these and more. 
When we say that God is the God of, and then we cite one of these, we make a larger claim than we often think. He's not just a God who, because of the way we wove Him together, makes us feel this way or that way. He is the one and only God from whom all blessings flow. Exactly as our doxology that we sing at the end of the day says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. The opening of Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The apostles on his way to Jerusalem, which he knew, he knew by the Holy Spirit's direct communication, would bring him violence, not peace. Yet he appeals to them to pray to the God of peace on his behalf. Often we must pray that we have peace even when we, there is none around to be seen. You think of Aaron's blessing. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You think of how Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 17. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In other words, let them be peaceful. Because the God of peace is with you. The peace we have with God, Romans chapter 5, verse 11, is an overarching peace that overrules anything that the world can throw at us. Do you remember the history in Acts of what happened to Paul when he got there? He went to the temple. And he was fulfilling a vow and he paid for the other men who were fulfilling a vow and they're at the temple, they're doing what the law required and there he was attacked while he was minding his own business which was fulfilling that vow in accordance with the law. He was attacked there. The riot was so severe that the Roman guard had to come in and intervene and they arrested him. Now what he was arrested for inciting a riot, if it had been proven true, this was no mis misdemeanor. This was a very serious offense. And it was such a serious thing to incite a, a riot that even before they had determined if he had even done that, they were going to flog him to get the truth out of him. He was going to be scourged. Scourging be what the Lord Jesus Christ went through before his crucifixion. And they stopped only when they learned that he was a Roman citizen. In all of this, with all of this being anticipated and having come true even, but with that being in his immediate future, according to this direct word from the Holy Spirit to him, he was peaceful. And even if he, as he asks the church to pray for him, to agonize with him, to pray as though they were in his situation, he's peaceful because he walks with the God of peace who gives his children, as he says later to the, to the Philippians, the peace that surpasses all understanding. At the end of this letter, as this letter is coming to a close, the apostle who had faced down the beasts at Ephesus, the apostle who had cursed powerful sorcerers into blindness, the Apostle Paul who stood before governors and jailers and torturers, this Apostle beseeches, this Apostle begs for prayer. Not a step forward unless he knows that his brothers and sisters are agonizing with him. Agonizing with him, it's both. It has to be both. We pray for ourselves. Then as our supplication rises up as a memorial before God, is met with all the others combining into this sweet aroma before the throne of grace. This is a reminder of what we said way back in chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we, do not, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So Paul with the saints, prayed for deliverance. And the Holy Spirit then groans these prayers, these weak prayers that were not what they ought to have been, and he, he groans them, he perfects them, and he brings them to God the Father in perfect accordance 
with God the Father's will, which God the Spirit knows perfectly. What did, what did the church pray? And probably what we would have prayed if we had gotten a request like that. And as we do pray, when we get requests like that, we have missionaries we support who work in some very dangerous and dark lands. I imagine Rome prayed the way we do. Something like, O oh Lord, guard your servant and keep him safe. If it be your will, deliver him from them and to us so that we can see them again. And as you watch over them in that dark, in that dangerous land, Lord, let your gospel go forth. Let this gospel of repentance for sin and forgiveness by God because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ go forth. Even this day in this place, let that gospel go forth from this pulpit. For anyone hearing us or anyone in this place this morning, listening, this is the gospel that Paul asks for prayers that he might expand wherever he goes. Everything he did was for this gospel. This gospel you need to hear. That God is holy. That you are a sinner. There's nothing you can do to bring yourself to God. That you're lost. You're born in iniquity and sin. We're born dead in transgression and sin. But only by God's mercy and only by what He has done in His Son Jesus Christ on the cross where He bore the wrath for your sins can you be saved. And this by faith and by faith alone. You must repent. You must repent and fall down before God and beg His forgiveness by and through what He did for you in His Son Jesus Christ if you will but believe. This is the gospel. This is the gospel which you must leave this place believing and setting your eternal soul upon. This is the gospel that if this day, if this moment, you should understand yourself a sinner and God a righteous and holy and good judge, angry at sin every day, if you will leave here knowing that God has forgiven you, by giving you the gift of faith which He alone and only He can give, then we've done something. Something that only God can do. We've proclaimed a good word that has power only because of God working in it. The gospel that we proclaim and live in this place, this day, is the same as Paul was asking for here. Asking for that to be given a free reign and so the church there would pray as we would pray, O oh Lord, guard, keep him safe. Do your will, but let the word of the Lord Jesus Christ go forth. Well, they prayed for him to be delivered from, and the Holy Spirit who hears these prayers then groans them into the will of God, which he knows because he knows the mind of God. And so when it becomes grant him deliverance to Rome, grant him deliverance to Rome in chains, Paul knows that he is following the will of God. Even if the result turned out different than it was hoped. Not delivered from, but delivered to. But praying confidently in the will of God. Praying confident that the brothers and sisters of that church were agonizing with him. He could still speak of the God of peace and say, may that God of peace be with you all. They close with a final observation. Paul blesses them with this doxology before they pray. Before they pray. He was confident that they would. Otherwise, he might have told the messenger something like this, watch and see if they pray and tell me as soon as you can whether they did or didn't. And then send me notice by the swiftest carrier so that in not more than nine or ten months I can bless them for having prayed. I can say thank you for your prayers now that I know that you did them. No, he blesses them as he writes. Such is his confidence. He knew that as soon as the issue is before them that they would pray, that they would agonize with him for God's will to be done through him. Do we pray like this? Do we see how important prayer is? Do we see this not just an afterthought? It's not just something we do. 
When the pastor or whatever preacher is here says, let us pray. In our Wednesday night prayers, when our faithful deacon leads us, and he says, let us pray. Do we drop our heads like robots? Do we close our eyes because we're supposed to? We should, and that's only to remove distractions. My eyes are open, I'm looking around. If my eyes are closed, I concentrate. But we need to pray like this. We need to pray together. We need to agonize as they did, as Paul called them to do. Agonizing with our brethren near or far as though their conflicts were our own. And it works the other way around too. When we ask for prayer, when I or you are the one in need, this confidence really helps us through. How many times have you been able to get through your issue, be it medical, be it job, be it relational, whatever it is, when you've asked for prayer and you know, you know that your brothers and sisters are praying for you? Not just an easy, yeah, I'll pray. Yes, brother, I will pray. I will agonize with you, asking questions delving into your experience, thinking of how many times I've gone through the same sort of thing. That kind of agonizing together. And how much confidence has that given us? How much has that strengthened us? Strengthened me, you, to know I can keep going because he, she, they are praying for me. And when we ask for prayer, when you and I are in need This is what gets us through. It's as if the head was actually on our own shoulders and received the prayers in the same way. Well, Paul closes the letter this way. And I hope if we look at these last four verses as this magisterial letter comes to a close, that we will together look at this and say, Well, these four verses to close this thing out. And after this, he's going to simply live this long list of all these people he knew and say, greet them and greet this person. He gives these short descriptors of them.